Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, nice to uh, see you all here. Minister Hazard, Minister Wyatt, good to see you as well. Any Wiradjuri people in the room? Ah, yes, we're, we're everywhere. Go on, Bana. Bother to Wiradjuri, give you. Dear Madalina, Bada Wiradjuri. Uh, I want to pay my respects to the, uh, the local people here as well, the traditional owners, and also acknowledge my own connection. My mother, of course, is Gamilaroi, my father, Wiradjuri, but I have a deep connection to this country as well. In 1860, my great-great-grandfather, Frank Foster, was living in the boat shed at Circular Quay with the, the remnants of the first people before he and his family were moved from here and sent out west where he married into Wiradjuri country. But of course, Foster family, part of my family, still living at La Perouse today. So I always feel as if part of me is here and, and, a, and a significant part of me belongs to this country as well. I want to talk today, and given the, uh, the theme of reset, I want to talk today about the idea of resetting the stories we tell about ourselves. That intersection of history, memory, trauma, and identity. The Polish Nobel Prize laureate poet, Czesław Milos, once wrote that perhaps all memory is the memory of wounds, the memory of wounds. Milos, of course, known to the world as a Polish poet, was in fact Lithuanian. And people familiar with the history of Lithuania would know that this was a country that in itself had been dominated by others, colonized by others. He once wrote that perhaps he was a Lithuanian for whom it was meant not to be a Lithuanian. And he touched on something really significant, something that scientists call transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, or as Milos would call it, the memory of wounds. These are environmentally induced changes passed down from one generation to the next, passed down, in fact, in story. Now, scientists have observed the impact of this in animals and in plants, and they're beginning to understand now the impact of this on humans as well. Childhood abuse, trauma, racism, prejudice, war, conflict, all of these things have a direct effect on our genes. Even trauma suffered in the womb can affect us. It alters the manner in which our genes are expressed. It physically suppresses the expression of critical parts of our DNA. Now, this, of course, manifests in real illness as well. It can lead to cancer, heart disease, learning difficulties, and suicide. All of these things that we see in our own people. The Jewish American writer Elizabeth Posner, whose parents survived the Holocaust, wrote a book last year called Survivor Cafe. And it grapples with this idea of this memory of wounds, the inheritance of trauma. And she grappled with this question of how do we cope with the trauma that we inherit? How do we keep alive our personal stories behind great historical atrocities? As she wrote in the book, I am more afraid of forgetting my parents' stories than I am of forgetting my own. And I suppose many of us would relate to that. Certainly I do. If I look at the stories that I was raised on, the stories that created my sense of my place in the world, my own identity, my parents' memories of wounds, they've had a direct impact on me. Like many of us, I was raised on those stories of the frontier wars that are still not talked about in our history books or in our schools. The story of my people, Wiradjuri in Bathurst, where after the crossing of the Blue Mountains, martial law was declared and my people were shot and killed on sight. Stories of poisoned waterholes, poisoned flour, family members rounded up and put on to missions, family members taken away and separated, and very direct links to stories of people that I grew up with. 
My father's father, who went to fight a war for this country when he was still not fully recognised as a citizen, a rat of Tobruk, came back in his uniform and refused entry on the train to go home, told that he was back in Australia now and he had to walk. Well, my mother's father, married to a white woman, living on the outskirts of town, being arrested from his bed for drinking and tied to a tree like a dog and left in the sun all day. Or when the police came and put a gun to his head to bulldoze the tin humpy that he'd built for his family and running over the graves of three of his children that he'd buried there. These are the deep memories of wounds that we are raised on. But how do we reset these stories? How do we lift this weight from our shoulders? Particularly at a time when history frames identity. As Elizabeth Posner said, at a time when we are still trapped in our nightmares. How do we change the narrative? Because that's what we're talking about. Just last year I heard a visiting American Indian writer being interviewed on ABC Radio about this trauma, the intergenerational trauma that her people were suffering. And she said, first, we have to change the story we tell ourselves. In many respects, we in this room here today are living through the best of times, alongside those of our own people who are living through the worst of times. As we heard earlier, those people who are still dying far too young in Australia, who are having the worst health, housing, education, employment outcomes. Those of us, and we heard Minister Hazard talk about this in the visit to a prison, those of us who are still far overrepresented in our prisons. We know those statistics. A quarter of the prison population, not even 3% of the general population. But at the same time, we can hold two thoughts. Yes, we are deeply disadvantaged as a group. Yes, there are far too many of us in prison. But while there are around nine or 10,000 Aboriginal people behind bars, there are more than 30,000 with university degrees. Go back 20 years ago, there were fewer than 2,000. There are probably, that number is likely to double in the next 10 years alone. I've enjoyed privileges and opportunities that my grandparents would never have dreamed of. Just yesterday, and you heard mention of this this morning, the New South Wales, uh, the, the new health report from the New South Wales Chief Health Officer, and Kerry Chant is, is here today along with Stephen Blunden. And it said simply, Aboriginal children born today have a better chance in life than at any time before. Teenage pregnancy rates halved in the past 20 years, pregnancy smoking rates down significantly, and infant mortality critically as well, almost halved over that same time. Of course there are still significant problems, but as Stephen pointed out, we should not lose sight of the achievements either. So how does this history impact on our identities? Franz Kafka, the famous author, once wrote, a cage went in search of a bird. A cage went in search of a bird. And in many ways, as I've grappled with my own sense of identity, my own place in the world, it sometimes feels like that. It sometimes feels as if we can live in a prison house of identity, something that narrows who we are, that shrinks us to one particular aspect of ourselves. We all have to tick that box on the census. Are you Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? That box can't possibly contain the full extent of my identity. It doesn't ask if I'm Wiradjuri, Gummeroy. It doesn't ask about my Irish heritage doesn't ask how I grapple with the idea of being an Australian. In Seslav Milos's words, perhaps an Australian for whom it's not meant to be an Australian. But identity that is narrowed, identity that is shrunk, identity that is exclusive, 
Identity that turns us into us and them, we know, is dangerous. The Indian economist and philosopher Amartya Sen has written about this and he calls it solitarist identities. He says that these are identities that can kill. As a reporter, having travelled the world, I lived outside of Australia for almost two decades, lived in five different countries, reported from more than 80 others, having seen the great conflicts of our time from the troubles in Northern Ireland to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, terrorism across Southeast Asia throughout the Middle East, the change and the rise of China, peering into the secretive world of North Korea. I've also seen how identity can inflame conflict. Think of the conflicts of our time, Catholic versus Protestant in Northern Ireland, rooted in a sense of identity and historical grievance. Think about Hutu and Tutsi, that genocide in Rwanda. Think about the blood feud between Shia and Sunni Islam. The standoff, the nuclear armed existential standoff between Hindu and Muslim over the border of Pakistan and India. The demilitarized zone that still marks a deep scar on the soul of the Korean people, that they are still grappling to come to terms with finishing a war that 70 years after it first started is still not officially over. The enmity between China and Japan, these deep, deep historical wounds and identities that at any moment could rise into conflict. Just this year during Australia Day, I was giving a speech in Hong Kong. It's fascinating for me when I'm away from Australia, breathing in different air, looking at my country from afar. It changes the way we see ourselves. I was looking back at what I think most of us would agree was probably one of the angrier Australia days that we've seen, the tensions that still exist here in the unresolved questions of reconciliation and the political recognition of Indigenous peoples in Australia, whether it be treaties or whether it be constitutional reform. And I was looking at the anger on the street and the, the passion in those protests and wondering, what does that say about me? Because like all of us in this room, we are drawn from black and white. We could come from no other place. The history of this country lives in us. We were born on the frontier. The struggle to bring black and white together in Australia is a struggle that lives in us. How do I marry my Wiradjuri ancestors or indeed my ancestors who stood on the shore and watched the first ships come here in Sydney with an Irish Catholic convict sent from his land in chains never to return again, his mother, sister and brother executed, whose name I still carry today, Grant. This is my struggle. This is the struggle of all of us in this country. It is a struggle to heal a nation and tell a story that all of us can connect to. The Ghanaian philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah has grappled with these ideas. In himself, he's born of an African father and a British mother. And he's written a lot about the idea of cosmopolitanism, a rooted cosmopolitanism. He says something that acknowledges both our cultures independently, our differences, and the universal things that bind us to each other. As the great philosopher Immanuel Kant would have said, those things that lift the ball and chain of being an everlasting permanent minority. Those things that allow us to say, I am a citizen of the world, that we find ourselves in each other. And I've thought a lot about this idea of cosmopolitanism as I've traveled the world. As I said, mine has been a life spent in the world, studying foreign places and traveling to other lands. I could tell you where to buy the best dumplings in Shanghai or take the 
to find the best chicken meal in Amman, Jordan. I could help you buy a guitar in Kabul, as I did, or watch a movie at my favourite art house cinema in Tel Aviv. I count among my dearest friends, colleagues from Iran, Pakistan, Iraq, China, Canada, South Korea. All of this has shaped me. All of it has given me a glimpse into worlds that I could only have imagined as a boy. I am the very essence of a cosmopolitan person. I am a citizen of the world, yet I am deeply rooted in the knowledge of where I come from. To stand here and say, Baladur Rajari Gibia, I am a Rajari man. To know what that means, to know what it is to stand on your land and know that your people have walked that land for tens of thousands of years. That whether I've been in Paris or New York or London or Rome or Shanghai or Pyongyang, I've been of a Rajari Gamalroy person, I've been an Aboriginal person and I've been an Australian person. I am an Australian, yet my history tells me that our sense of citizenship and belonging in this country has always been fragile and fraught. So Kwame Anthony Appiah says that the shaping of our lives is up to us. But how do we do that? How do we shape our identities and our sense of selves, of ourselves, when quite often that's a reflection of how other people see us, that our lives are shaped by others? Appiah says that identities make ethical claims. We live our lives as gay or straight or male or female or black or white. Sometimes those categories themselves blurred and less certain. He poses this question. Do identities curb our autonomies or provide its contours? Do our identities give us a sense of possibility or do our identities shut down our capacity to live fulfilled lives? These are precisely the sort of questions I've had to ask myself. And I've had to look at this question of the role of history in telling our story. As Elizabeth Posner said, more afraid of forgetting my parents' story than my own. Those memories of wounds. More than a decade, uh, more than a century ago rather, when Australia, it was still presumed that Aboriginal people would die out when that phrase, the smoothing of the dying pillow, was used. When we were writing a constitution that specifically said, when reckoning the numbers of the people of the Commonwealth, Aboriginal natives will not be counted. Ernest Renan, a French philosopher and historian, was pondering the question of what it is to belong to a nation. And it rem remains one of the most profound and powerful statements of identity ever written. And Renan said, we need to look beyond the grave errors of race or language or religion. A nation, he said, was defined, not defined by any one thing, but was the sum of its many parts. The fusion, he said, of the populations that comprised them. The nation, he wrote then, was a daily referendum, a perpetual affirmation of life, a daily referendum. The ability to come together and to say, what are the things that we believe in? Who are we today? How have we changed from yesterday? Who do we want to be tomorrow? He said it was the search for a collective identity, a collective identity. Renan wrote that a nation is a soul a spiritual principle. It was born of a marriage of the past and the present. One, the possession of a rich trove of memories. The other, the actual consent, the desire to live together, the will to continue to value an undivided shared heritage. The question that I was asking myself on Australia Day, how does the black and the white in me find a story in common. It's a challenge to our age to read Ernest Renan. Do we endlessly prosecute grievance or do we set aside the past to find true unity? 
today, if we look around the world, history is often used as a weapon. Think about the, the politicians who are undoubtedly the most successful of our time. Not the most, not necessarily the best or most effective, but the most successful. Who are the politicians that dominate our world? They are politicians with a deep connection and understanding to the beating heart of their people, to the idea of the history that has forged them, often in very negative ways. It's why Vladimir Putin can talk about the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century being the collapse of the Soviet Empire. And he knows that that touches something, a deep, deep sense of collective belonging amongst his own people. Or Xi Jinping in China, who can talk about the 100 years of humiliation. That's the phrase the Chinese use to describe the successive generations of domination and oppression from foreign forces. Or when Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey talks about restoring the caliphate, restoring the greatness of the Ottoman Empire. Or when Donald Trump talks about making America great again. They're touching something, some yearning for a nostalgia, a past, fueled by an historical grievance, something that says, I am this and you are that. There is an us and there is a them. Borders are going back up around our world. Free trade is in retreat. China and the US on the verge of a trade war. Refugees being turned away from countries around the world. Britain voting to exit the European Union. Populist parties on the rise throughout Europe. The global world order that we have understood after World War II is in retreat. Many have called this the post-American world, where America is no longer the guarantor of democracy and universal ideas of human rights, but retreats to its own borders to fight its own battles. This is the story of our times, and history lies at the heart of this. The journalist and philosopher David Reif was inspired by Ernest Renan for a book that he wrote in 2017 called in praise of forgetting. And it was a really confronting idea. We know we have to remember our history. We know we have to remember the stories of our past and our parents. But what are we prepared to forget? Ernest Renan said that nations are built as much on forgetting as they are on remembering. David Reef confronted the old adage that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Instead, he wrote, thinking about history is far more likely to paralyse than encourage. Far more likely to paralyse than encourage. He's back where I started, the memory of wounds, the epigenetic inheritance the trauma that is passed from one generation to another, the need to be able to tell a different story, not to forget disadvantage, not to forget suffering, but not to forget that we have survived as well. To reef, clinging too tightly to a history of us and them creates a formula for unending grievance and vendetta. And anyone who looks around the world could not agree with, could not disagree with that. 30 years as a reporter in the world, if it's told me one thing, is that holding to grievance leads to conflict. I want to finish with a great story of what someone once described as radical hope. The legendary Crow Indian chief, Plenty Coup, was a man who'd won his respect in battle. The crows used to have a strategy for battle where they would ride out and they would place a stake in the ground. That would be their territory. Anyone seeking to take their territory would have to ride up and touch that stake. And they did so under threat of death. To have killed warriors in battle was known as collecting coups. Chief Plenty Coup 
had won a lot of battles. And he told this story of how when the buffalo died, his people's hearts fell to the ground and they could not lift them up again. After that, he said, nothing happened. Nothing happened. History ceased. A people ceased to believe in themselves and to belong. And he said his challenge was to find a way to lift his people's hearts again. Before he died, Plenty Coup was inv invited to Washington, D.C. for a ceremony of the tomb of the unknown soldier. And he came forward and he laid on the coffin his war bonnet. It wasn't a surrender. It was the act of a survivor. It was an act of courage. It was a commitment to give his people a new chance in life and to live a life of peace and hope. It was to live a life free of the memory of wounds. Thank you so much.